I'm uh, Emeritus Professor of Statistics in Cambridge, um, and uh, I used to work in the Institute of Public Health for many years and up, uh, up at the, um, on the Adamrook site. Um, I've changed the title a bit. I did say communicating public health evidence to the public, but I'm going to just talk about public health evidence in general to anybody, because you can see I'm going to look at quite a complex communication landscape. Um, also, conflict of interest, I'm a non-executive director in the UK Statistics Authority, so therefore I'm going to say good things about national statistics. I used to do statistical methodology, uncertainty in artificial... We were working on uncertainty in artificial intelligence and solved it in the 1980s, for heaven's sakes. Never mind, it's all been forgotten. I don't know why, why I bothered. Anyway, so, um, so Bayesian statistics, and then I was lucky in 2007 to turn into a... Um, communicating a performing statistician because I got funded by a hedge fund manager David David Harding to to do work you know so I could make documentaries on BBC and there's me, oh there's me showing how much toast you'd have to eat every day in order to get enough acrylamide to possibly raise the ri your risk to the level that was the lower end of a 95% confidence interval for an increased risk for a mouse and that's how much you'd have to eat every day. And um, the FSA were going to have a campaign about not burning your toast, so which I thought was nonsense. Anyway, that's by the way. And then I do stuff like that and go on game shows. Anyway, um, so and I've written some books. Okay, um, okay. This is the crucial thing. I, the landscape of communication about evidence in anything is very complicated, and I've done a very big simplification up here. On the top left, we have us. The analysts, the researchers, the academics, and so on. Actually, not all of us. Some of us are over, like Mike is over on the right-hand side, the policy and the decision makers, the people who actually um, you know, form the policy who make the decision, the people who have the power, essentially. And then you've got the public and the media underneath. And all types of communication are important there. I'm going to talk quite a lot about this one, but also this one and this one. The crucial thing is, and that one, and that one, and that one. The point is the communication goes all the way around and also backwards because you have to listen to your audiences. First rule of communication is shut up and listen. What are their concerns? What are they worried about? So all of those are of interest. And what I suppose what I'm going to try to do is to say that actually there are common themes across all of those. So I don't have to, although I will use specific examples on those, I don't really have to talk about each one separately. I, I, that's my running theme. There are common issues that we should be trying to adhere to. Um, okay, I'm going to start off with some stories, only some of which are concerned with public health. I'm going to whip through these. I was going to call these horror stories because these are horror stories. Um, okay, here's one. Apocalypse warning. Insect population must be saved. Life will disappear from 2019. Um, another Guardian article, 40% of insect species are declining. Total mass of insects is falling by a precipitous 2.5%. No insects in 40 years. Anyway, so, okay, those were the headlines. And it came from an academic paper, a systematic review published in a peer-reviewed journal. But if you looked at that in more detail, they were very good in terms of they did their systematic review. They put their search terms, the search you know, um, instructions, in the bottom of the paper, like all good systematic reviews should. And when we look at those search terms, you find out they searched on insect and survey and decline. So they only look for papers that mentioned a decline. And guess what? They found a decline. Isn't that amazing? So this is complete nonsense. Absolutely fraudulent. And they were unapologetic about it when they were interviewed about it. They said, we've got to raise awareness. What's interesting is that if they had done a... Um, search on increase, they would have found even more papers. <laughs> so what that just shows, okay, that's an example of chronic selection bias. This is doing the research in order to find the evidence to prove what you want to say anyway. And it can happen. So, okay, let's more of a look at more public health message. Is there no safe level of drinking? This is a paper from the uh, you know, uh, Global Burden of Disease, Alcohol Collaborators, got a Lancet 2018, got a huge amount of um, Coverage in the press release, it says, oh, no, I think in the paper, it says that our results show that the safest level of drinking is none. Huge coverage. No amount of alcohol use is safe. No alcohol is safe to drink. No amount of alcohol is safe to drink. How just one drink at eight means premature death? And I've heard this, this study being used as justification for policy changes. It's being used as, as, as from, by policymakers using this paper. Okay, let's look at this. What do they say about light drinking? 
The press release said that drinking one alcoholic drink a day increases the annual risk of developing one of the 23 alcohol-related health risks by 0.5% compared to not drinking at all. So that went from 914 people in 100,000 to 918 in 100,000 for people who consume one alcoholic drink a day. So it gave a relative risk, and then it gave an absolute risk. But those expected frequencies, that second paragraph, are not in the paper. There are no absolute risks in the paper, only the relative risks. The Lancet Press Office had to get them from the authors, in spite of the fact that the Lancet guidelines say explicitly that for risk changes or effect sizes, give absolute values rather than relative changes. So this major paper um, in, in the Lancet broke the Lancet guidelines, but the press office, bless them, had to go and get this data from them. So we went from 914 to 918 cases. And uh, let's assume those are, are actually known. Let's put this in perspective. That means 25,000 people having one drink a day for a year gives rise to one extra serious health event. Okay, uh, this is the number needed to drink. This is my new unit of analysis. Okay, let's put it in perspective. You know, one 10 gram, these are 10 gram drinks, uh, is 3.65 kilograms of alcohol a year. That's equivalent to um, 16 bottles of gin. Okay, so that means for 25,000 people, that's 400,000 bottles of gin have to be drunk every year for one extra health event. That's enough. If you prop them up, that's enough from here to Milton Keynes. So you're going to drink all that gin for one extra health event. Um, and what about uncertainty? In fact, the uncertainty, if we blow it up, goes below one, the relative risk. So they're not even sure. So this, basically, this 0.5% is neither statistically nor clinically significant. And yet that drove the headlines. No ink, no excess, no alcohol is safe. And the curious thing is that in 2022, they reversed their findings. The same group now find a dip, a J-shaped curve, that light alcohol is protective from all cause mortality, from mortality. No coverage at all. Complete reversal of what they claimed in 2019. So no coverage. So I think this is really shabby stuff really shabby. And yet, that first paper will be used in policy decisions. I don't believe this paper either, of course. You know, it's based on just taking every study there are and just bunging it in some great opaque data analytic algorithm. So I don't believe either of them, but that's what will get published. And no, almost no coverage. So, you know, you can be criticized it for all sorts of reasons as well. Okay, attribution in climate change. So I'm having a go at everybody here. I'm very, I'm very, I'm very sort of ecumenical. I'll attack everybody. Human influence on Hurricane Florence. Uh, two days before the landfall of Hurricane Florence, it was claimed in this paper, uh, in this report, rapid report, it's going to increase 50% of rainfall. It's going to be 80 kilometers larger due to the effect of climate change made by very prominent climate scientists. Unfortunately, and it got a huge amount of coverage, climate change, global warming, turbocharging, monster, blah, blah, blah. Quite clear that the authors were pushing a message. They were campaigning. The important message from this is that dangerous climate change is here now. So they were pushing their message. Unfortunately, they had to retract the whole thing two years later and say that it didn't. It may be, they don't know whether it increased rainfall or not, plus or minus 5%. It might have been nine kilometers wider. So actually a trivial amount is attributable to man-made climate change in terms of this hurricane. So the entire uh, um, promotion was, was retracted with no coverage. Okay, finally, this is one of my favorites. You may have seen me use this one before. Lovely paper, staggeringly dull, nor, you know, Scandinavian paper. Sort they can do because they've got a personal number so they can link tax and, and education and health records. And uh, so we observe consistent associations between higher socioeconomic position, higher risk of glioma. Good paper, good, you know, good team, good, good analysis. Um, okay, why might you get an association between brain cancer risk and, uh, and socioeconomic position? Two reasons. Yeah, wealthier people get, actually get better health care. They go for better health care. Other reason that they didn't just for... Well, I, I, they, you, you'll know that they'll adjust it for this age. You know, rich people live, live longer, but that's adjusted for as a Cox regression analysis. But they did say this could be an artifact due to increased use of healthcare. However, the press release thought that, you know, this is a bit, let's, let's, let's tart this up a bit. 
High levels of education linked to heightened brain tumor risk. Yeah, that wasn't the point of the paper, but never mind. It was in a table three somewhere. Um, and of course, when, by the time it gets to the Daily Mirror, we get why going to university increases the risk of getting a brain tumor. It's all that thinking. You know, watch out. Your brain heats up. Really dangerous stuff. So, okay, there's four stories there. You know, as I said, horror stories. Well, what are the issues can we take from that? The one bit is people clearly going outside their academic role as researchers into policy advocacy and treating their work as a campaign. Second thing is poor research practices leading to misleading claims, either deliberate or accidental. And third is press releases, the importance of the press release leading to misleading media coverage. And I see these all, so maybe I've become particularly alert to them, I see them all the time, and I'm afraid quite particularly in public health claims. All of these occur. And I think this is unfortunate. And I think it's something to really guard against. We've got to be, we've got to be the goodies and not suffer from white hat bias. Do you know, have you heard of white hat bias? Oh, that's great. Okay. It's, a, it's in Wikipedia, so it must be true. Um, it's the bias leading to the distortion of information in the service of what may be perceived to be in the righteous ends. We're the goodies, so we're allowed to bend the rules. Yeah, you know, it's like, Parties in number 10. So it, we're, you know, we know best. We want to alert people. So we're only going to talk about one side of the argument. We're only going to give the positives. We're not going to talk about the negatives. We're going to pick the evidence that suits what we want because we believe it's right. And he may be right. He may absolutely be right. So this is true. Right is on their side. But, it, but they regard that as an entitlement to bend the evidence. I think this is completely unacceptable. OK, so my personal view is that public policy is political. Politicians need to take responsibility. Research does not say what the correct policy should be, particularly public health research in more than anybody else's research, because at least it may take a balanced view about total impact on the population. But research does not tell you. So I'd say keep research communication separate from policy advocacy. It doesn't mean you can't be policy advocates. You need to try to keep them separate. I think this is a real challenge, but I think it's something we should all be aware of. The other thing is that what I'm not saying is that one has to be, um, you know, meticulously. <laughs> it is okay for advocate ad, to advocate and to try to persuade people to be interested in the subject, to engage with it. There's no point in being trustworthy if you're dull. So you've got to, to, and that's what I want to talk about now: is how to actually tell good stories in order to get, get people to engage with the issues without wagging your finger and telling them what to do. So the, the problem is that we do see, again, you know, sorry, another horror story. Oh, I, I, the negative, I, I'm going to tell some positive stories in a minute. I, I know that, but the negative ones are so much more fun. Anyway, okay, here we are. June 2021, UK HSA present this table showing that um, the majority of COVID deaths are in the people who've been vaccinated. So far more COVID deaths in people who've been vaccinated. Okay, now, okay, and um, why is this a completely reasonable thing to observe. Why would we expect this to occur after a vaccine run? Yes? Most people are vaccinated, yeah. What, if you, had, if you were having your dinner with so your skeptical uncle who's anti-vax, and he says, look at this, the vaccines are killing people, um, how would you explain that to him without using Bayes' theorem? How, what, what, is there an analogy or a story you might use for that? We didn't think of this. Somebody else thought of this and we copied it. What's the analogy you might tell that might say, oh, that's it. That's the thing. Okay. The one that I've, the one we stole that somebody suggested was seatbelts. Most people who die in car accidents are wearing seatbelts. Because nearly everyone's wearing a seatbelt and they're not completely effective. In other words, the rate, so the rate of death in wearing a seatbelt is far less than the rate of death if you're not wearing a seatbelt. But so many people wearing seatbelts that, that they, the actual deaths outnumber them. So that's, that we use the seatbelt analogy all the time there. And we tried to explain this in the paper, in the, in the Observer, why most people who die with COVID and have had a vaccination, and you know, it's perfectly reasonable. This wasn't appreciated by some, just as a warning for those of you who put your heads above the parapet. Um, this is the sort of tweets you get. David Spigolda, blah, blah, and the entire lying genocidal editorial board of The Guardian should be hunted down and destroyed for crimes against humanity, period. So this is a sort of, you know, you have to get used to this sort of stuff. Um, um, and we're, we're, I'm quite, feel I'm quite fortunate. I'm a privileged, white, old, high-status man. 
So actually, this stuff just bounces off. Um, and we could make a joke about it. Anthony said, that seems harsh. I thought it was a good article. <laughs> Perhaps a bit harsh. I've had worse referees reports. And this started off a whole meme with people saying, referee two thinks you are genocidal and should be destroyed. I therefore invite further revisions. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, there's President Bolsonaro using that data from UKHSA, that's UK data there, um, to say that vaccine, COVID vaccines are killing people. So it just shows that badly presented information or, or information without sufficient warnings on it can just go around the world and be used by everybody. GB News, triple jabbed are four times more likely to die from COVID, blah, 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 in 2022. I mean, I complained about that. Unfortunately, 700 other people did. And uh, this is one of the many cases where GB News has been found to be in breach of broadcasting rules. I did get invited to go on GB News on the Lawrence Fox program a little while ago. And I said, I'd rather pull my own head off. <laughs> okay, so what are we talking about? We're talking about trust, really. This was what trustworthiness. This is a crucial um, sort of ideas that I think run through the work I've been doing for years now with my team at Winton. And it all comes down to a Nora Neill. You know, Cambridge philosopher, specialist in Kant, Baroness Nora Neill. She is great. She is wonderful. And she's got this great TED talk. Um, if you Google it, you know, Oh, you know, what we don't understand about trust, and it's full up with, you know, trust and jokes and cant and all this sort of stuff. Anyway, she's, she's got an insight which is so basic and so fundamental, and yet has been so influential to me and a lot of others, um, is which she says, we shouldn't be trying to be trusted. You know, because we get, I get people coming to, oh, how can we get, get ourselves trusted? We want to be trusted. We want my, our organization, we want to be trusted. We're doctors, we're right, we're good. We want to be trusted. And she said, wrong. Wrong question to ask. You are you are starting from totally the wrong place. You should be trying to demonstrate trustworthiness. The onus is upon you to deserve that trust. And you may then get it offered up to you. But crucially, all the responsibility goes back to you to be trustworthy. And that um, is great. It's become the foundation for the national statistics system in this country. The Code of Practice for Statistics was just being revised at the moment. Staggeringly dull document. Anyway, but, but it's wonderful. It's really good um, because it, um, it, it's the document that allows the Office for Statistics Regulation to publicly criticize politicians for misusing statistics. And the number one pillar for official statistics in this country is trustworthiness. And uh, the, Ian Diamond, the chief statistician, was giving evidence to the COVID inquiry recently. And he said, it's not up to us you know, to, is not to, to, you know, to demand trust. We have to demonstrate trustworthiness. He used it in the inquiry. He thought, yes, channeling Anora. Great. We all channel Anora. She's just, a, just you know, she's a great, she's what I call a soundbite philosophy. She can distill, you know, decades of work on duty ethics into, you know, into a few bullet points. Um, and here's another one that is, is not quite, yeah, I think it is relevant, that, again, we use all the time, this idea of intelligent transparency. You know, if you're going to open up, if you're part of being trustworthy is being transparent, being open about your data, about your sources. And if you're going to do that, she's got four, these are really good principles. First one is accessible. People have got to be able to get it. And that's easier, easier done now because of the web and things like that. But it can't just be some massive PDF. You've got to make the data available and so on. It's people have got to be able to understand it. And you have to check that. You have to listen to check they can. it's comprehensible to them. It's got to be usable. This is the really important one. It's got to answer their questions, their concerns. That means you have to listen. Again, shut up and listen to find out what their concerns are. They may not be your concerns. They may be interested in issues that you didn't never even thought of, but you have to know what they are and address them. And then finally, you might think, oh, that's pretty good. That's not bad. There's one more. It's got to be accessible. Someone has to be able to check your working if they want to. Outside bodies, interested at other experts, other teams. And most people won't. They'll take it on trust. But you have to have your working available. Down a few layers, not up front. You know, it can be down a few layers, but it's got to be accessible. You've got to make it accessible if necessary. So let's try to do better. How can we do better? Um, many people have written. Oh, God, what's happened to my text there? Never mind. Okay. Um, it'll become clear. Um, so the, we wrote a paper in Nature with, you know, all the Cambridge academics, Sander van der Linden, Theresa Marteau, and others. Um, we wrote this paper in a uh, little, little sort of um, opinion piece in Nature a few years ago, where we tried to distill our work, you know, what we thought, down to five basic points. And the first one, which underlies my title of my talk, is inform, not persuade. And that is a crucial thing. You have to decide yourself. Are you trying to manipulate someone into doing what you want them to do? 
or voting how you want them to do, or, or buying what you want them to do, or thinking how you want them to do? Or are you genuinely trying to empower them to make a better decision for, on their own grounds by providing them with better information, balanced information? You have to decide yourself and be honest with yourself. What is it you're trying to do? Then you've got to be balanced, not a false balance. Climate change, yes. Climate change, no. Oh, 50-50, no. Come on, but it's got to be balanced. You've got to talk about the potential benefits and harms, the winners and losers of any policy. You've got to look at both sides of it and give them equal emotional salience. You've got to be upfront about uncertainties and the quality of the evidence for your claim. And the bottom one you can't see is, is um, uh, pre-bunk misinformation, which is absolutely vital. Get in there hard and early to hit possible misunderstanding. Don't allow this Bolsonaro stuff to spread. To get in there and make sure that on the table and inseparable from the PDF, it says this cannot be used to judge something in big print. Get in there and preempt it early. And this is you know, based a lot of this work is on Sander van der Linden's idea of inoculation against misinformation. So, I mean, the sort of principles I'm thinking about from a, a health point of view for informing, you know, you're trying to get an informed health choice or decision about your or lifestyle choice. Persuading is you're trying to change behavior. Now, I've also worked for the behavior change unit. And some, you know, so I'm interested in changing behavior. But actually, if you are doing policies to change behavior, those nudges, other things like that, it's crucial, though, that people should have the evidence to judge why you're doing, why these regulations or rules or changes are being done, so that you're upfront about why you are doing this and what the evidence is. So informing, you know, the process is to co-produce material with, with the audiences and so on, with patients, checking, checking all the impact. And if you persuading, marketing strategies, nudges and so on, you're using all those tricks in the book to try to get people to change their attitudes or behavior. You use absolute risks for informing, you use relative risks for persuading. We know that psychological difference on those. You talk about potential benefits and harms, but for persuading you choose, you only emphasize the particular one particular actions. We talk about that. And um, for the success is if you provide the decision, satisfaction with decision, lack of regret, improved understanding, success on the persuading is that they do what you want them to do. And we, you have to decide which of those are you doing. And if you're on the right hand side, you really have to justify to everybody why you're doing it and be upfront at least with yourself that you're trying to do it. Okay, and the nice thing is that we, these guidelines reordered those five points and they uh, pre-bunk, reliably inform, balance, verify quality, explain uncertainty is they, if you look at the first terms, it's called P-R-O-V-E. This is the proof, this are suggestions which we knocked out, you know, as a little gang. And now pro the proof framework, which are part of the government communication service resist to counter disinformation toolkit. So those principles now are part, officially part of government communication to counter disinformation. But I think they go beyond just countering disinformation. I think they're principles that can hold in every type of communication you're trying to do. But obviously countering disinformation is very important. I'd like to give a, a success story on this, which I think is back in 2021. In April, there was um, great concern. You remember the blood clots and the AstraZeneca vaccine. Um, it's a real crisis around Europe, people stopping giving the vaccine and all that sort of stuff. And uh, we were contacted on the Monday by MHRA to, where they pressed the, the briefing to the public was going to be on the Wednesday. And um, could we help with their communications? Well, whoa, OK, thank you very Thanks for the warning. Um, anyway, so um, and they sent us the data on the blood clot data, which we got. We could fit regressions to it and look at their relationships with age. And we also had a model with, through John Aston. Um, and of, of the um, uh, benefits of the vaccine in different age groups. And we worked away with Alex Freeman doing the design and we worked for you know 48 hours solid and produced that essentially, um, which is the graphic then we sent down to Jonathan Van Tam on the Wednesday morning. I spent, I talked to him, he understood it absolutely right. And we thought this is for his information. And we were slightly surprised that come the actual BBC thing, he just put it up on the screen went straight out to the public. And we thought, oh, I, we, I, I was watching it. I thought, oh my God, he's not going to try to explain that, is he? <laughs> that was for him. And uh, actually, because he's such a trusted individual, perhaps because he's so, you know, he's got a good start. And he took time. He treated the audience with respect, as intelligent people, took them right through it. It was really lovely, a masterclass in communication of a really complex topic. There are so many dimensions on that graphic. 
Um, there's, I mean, there's three graphics because the first thing is the underlying risk in the, in the population. That was at a time of quite low prevalence of the, of the virus. So low exposure risk. Then we're looking at both benefits and harms on a, as a balance, deliberately on left and right to balance them. Trying to use color scheme that isn't too emotionally, trying to avoid bright reds or anything like that. So a fairly innocuous color scheme. Um, crucially though, stratifying by age, which is the absolute dominant factor on each of those things. And what we can see there um, is, and I used to be in that bottom group, is that you know, in that bottom group, the benefits in terms of uh, prevention of visits to ICU over the next four weeks of the vaccination were you know, really quite substantial and hugely outweigh potential risks of the blood clots. You know, whoa, you know, on the risk benefit balance, no question, jab it in me, stick it in me. That's just fine. But as you get younger, the benefits go down very fast indeed. The benefits, the direct benefits of the vaccination to young, young people is very small indeed, absolutely minimal. But um, the harms go up. The risk did increase as you got younger of these blood clots. And so by the time you get to under 30s, well, you know, that's first do no harm. It's, you know, it becomes a bit of a, you know, obviously a strong issue. And, and Van Tam went through all that. And they said, so we're recommending that people under 30 don't get the vaccine. And everyone just said, fine, yes, no fuss, no accusation of U-turn, no, no uproar, no complaints from the media or anyone, really accepted by people that this was the right thing to do, later end up to 40. Um, and uh, it got copied, that, that graphic got copied. You know what is in Italian, there's EMA copied it, everyone copied it. People were cutting it out and sticking it on the windows of surgeries and things like that. Because it, you know, it really, we, and it was a lot of work to produce something as simple as that, but it couldn't get any simpler. That's as simple as you could get it. So if people, but what it shows is that if, if the communicator is willing to take some time and the audience is actually interested and people were interested, then you can do something fairly complicated and balanced. This isn't, wasn't, there's no persuasion there at all. It was an explanation essentially of a policy. And um, that went down very well. So what's the effect of being non-persuasive? Here am I saying you should be non-persuasive. You shouldn't be trying to, um, you know, hammer home a message. You should do this. You should do the other. And people might say, oh, well, God, if we don't do that, if we say, well, we don't know, and well, you know, blah, 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 there's positives and benefits. Why would anyone take any notice of it? How are we ever going to get anything done unless we try to persuade people? And I'd like to say that evidence is against you if you claim that. Okay, and so our evidence is randomized trials. I work with fantastic experimental psychologists who do randomized trials. And what they did is produce is a wonderful paper, this. So they produced uh, campaign messages um, about uh, COVID vaccines and about nuclear power. And deliberately in two styles of messages. The first was the classic, vaccines are safe and effective, you should take them. And nuclear power is great, you know, it's, you know, it's, it's safe and it's fine, it doesn't blah, blah, blah. And then a balanced message. Well, vaccines, you know, are not completely safe and they're not completely effective. And in some groups of people, they may not be appropriate, et cetera. The full stuff, you know, written well. And, uh, you know, the messages are in the paper. Um, so, and, and people were randomized, not within person randomization. So we, each person only got one message. And they had to grade them, rank them according to the, you know, the trustworthiness of the, so how much they trusted the source and the information. So they had to, had to score them. And people could tell the difference. Remember, this is a between-person randomization. So people only saw one message. And it's quite clear that in terms of balance, you know, the two messages, people could tell the difference. That one was one message was more one-sided, the other was more balanced. That one was trying to be persuaded, the other was trying to inform. That um, one, you know, admitted certainty, the other admitted uncertainty, and so on. Not huge differences, but you never do because there's such scatter there. But they were clearly different, perceived as different. Okay, what's the effect? This is the crucial thing. If we look at people who already were accepting a, this crucial thing is there's an interaction. You can't just look at the main effect here. The main effect was very, it was minimal. If we, but we need to look at an interaction. You need to stratify by people's initial attitudes. If they were initially fairly pro-vaccines or pro-nuclear power, it made no difference. But of course it didn't because they were already persuaded. So they didn't care whether it was a one-sided message. They probably nodded their head and said, fine. <laughs> So that's, but they're not the people you're trying to get at. They're not the people you're interested in. Well, you're interested in the skeptics. If you want, if you do want to change, if you really do want to change behavior, you're interested in the skeptics, the people who don't believe in the vaccines particularly and who are skeptical about nuclear power. 
there you get a, you know, a significant effect. People trust the balanced message more than the unbalanced. People are not stupid. They can tell when they're you know, being hammered with a bit of propaganda, and they could tell that the balanced message was more trustworthy. Now, you can see this in two different ways. It depends how you frame this answer. One is that um, you know, they, these skeptics thought the balanced message was more, more trustworthy. The other way to view it is that by being unbalanced and giving the standard one-sided message, you are actively decreasing trust in the very group you're trying to reach. You are destroying your, you are actually going against what you're trying to do by being one-sided and untrustworthy. I, I think it's, it's an extraordinary simple lesson that comes out of that. And I believe it. It was great to see it, but I, I really believe it. Because people are not daft. They can tell with propaganda when they see it. So don't use propaganda. So communicate. Trustworthy communication is vital to all stakeholders. I mean, I could have talked a lot about direct communication of politicians to the public. You know, I got a whole thing about the briefings and how ghastly they were. Anyway, so, um, but, but again, the difference between the political briefings with Boris Johnson in the middle and the one on the, on the vaccines, which had no politicians, just as Jonathan Van Tam and the people in JCVI, were, is just like chalk and cheese in terms of the quality of the communication and, the, and the, actually the response of the public. Treat all audiences with respect, whether they're the policymakers, everybody, treat them with respect. Evaluate the communications, of course. You've got to check this. And I say, just repeat it again. Inform rather than persuade, or if you are trying to persuade, be honest with yourself and everybody if that's what you're trying to do. Balance and acknowledging uncertainty does not reduce trust in the source and may even increase it, and I think it does increase it for the very people you're trying to reach. You've got to be clear about quality strength. Then preempt misunderstandings. God, just get in there and try to hit them hard. You don't, you can't always work them out in advance what people are going to misunderstand. People have amazing capacity for misunderstanding, but um, try to do that. But th and this takes work. This takes a bit of time and effort, um, but it can be done. Just a, a final warning. Um, because I, you know, I, this whole thing could be considered as a fight against misinformation and disinformation. I am personally responsible for a piece of disinformation in the pandemic. I've got to own up. I've got to own up. I was on the Today program in December 2020, and this is before Christmas, contemplating a, a lockdown or something. I said that raised vi voices could spread the virus, which is true. And it's maybe singing, maybe band. And our choir, I don't know, we were singing on Parker's Peace with masks outdoors two meters apart we still did it it was fun okay and then i said i was feeling a bit mischievous so i said maybe good i did a ban family arguments as a, <laughs> as, a, as a as a public health measure i mean nothing worse over christmas dinner all shouting at each other in an unventilated room super spreader event it was a joke an hour later in the daily express Christmas warning, families could be banned from arguing to prevent COVID spread, according to a leading British statistician. So I, I, I'm afraid I'm deeply proud of my personal little piece of disinformation that was spread. Okay, thank you very much indeed.